you for this opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit about diabetic retinopathy. So, and to start off, um, I have no relevant. Just move us up a little bit. Really talk loud. Oh, I do have a low voice. Um, uh, I have no personal financial relationships to disclose. So, just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is just give you some background of the disease, the significance of what we're doing, um, a screening overview, and talk a little bit about our teleretinal screening program in DHS, and then a bit of a call to action at the end, which is really to focus on this teachable moment that this uh, screening uh, for diabetic retinopathy provides for all of us. Diabetic retinopathy is damage to the blood vessels of the retina that's caused by diabetes, to put very simply. Um, but it's the leading cause of blindness in working age Americans. And in the safety net, it's truly e an epidemic. Uh, a large study of Latinos in our own population here in Los Angeles, many of them uh, you know, DS DHS patients, uh, showed that a prevalence of this disease of close to 50% in diabetics. But it's treatable. Early treatment for diabetic retinopathy study, which is a landmark study in ophthalmology, showed that effective treatment can reduce severe vision loss by, um, from this disease by up to 94%. And that's when it's really a travesty when we don't actually get to it in time. At least 40 to 45% of diabetics who can benefit from earlier detection and treatment don't get it. And that number is probably far higher in the safety net. So what does diabetic retinopathy look like? Just to give you a little bit of a pictorial um, image of what I'm talking about, here's a, you know, a cartoon diagram of the retina. You can see growing, when blood vessels grow in that um, ambiance of high blood sugar, they don't look normal. They don't grow right. That's the abnormal blood vessels. I always compare it for my patients of a twisted tree rather than, uh, you know, a tree with twisted branches rather than, you know, long, uh, graceful ones. And then there's hard exudates because those vessels are leaky. They're not healthy. Microaneurysms, little hemorrhages throughout the retina. And then cotton wool spots. Um, look just like a little ball of cotton, and that's ischemic retina. Um, so you can see that none of that is really leading to healthy vision. What does it look like when you're the patient? This. Um, and this is uh, effect on the central retina. This can happen throughout, so all throughout peripheral and central vision uh, when this disease advances. But it can be asymptomatic almost up until this point. So this can happen very quickly from the patient's view, but then from our view, this has been building for quite some time. So that's why this is a great disease for us to, do, to, for us to screen for. We can treat for it. We can act on it when we catch it early enough. The general U.S. screening rates for diabetic retinopathy are still not great. They're approximately 60%. But the U.S. inner city safety net screening rates drop far lower, less than 25%. In DHS, the last time we looked, um, uh, you know, given some inex inexactness, we were ranging around that 25 to 30%. Some factors that impact this disparity between the inner city rates and the national screening rates are shortage of specialists for retinopathy screening, and then our vast number of patients. There's just a large number of uninsured or underinsured patients out there. And then the patient misconceptions about utility of regular eye exams. Again, this is an asymptomatic disease often until it becomes symptomatic. So I often compare it to a bomb that goes off in the back. Everything seems fine, though it's ticking away, and then suddenly you get the big black spots in the vision. And at that point, we haven't done the treatments that we could have done to stop this earlier on. So we're often in progressing into the um, realm of permanent damage. The historical process for diabetic retinopathy screening in the DHS system was like this. A diabetic patient would be seen in a primary care clinic, be that in the DHS facilities or in the community partners, then was referred into our DHS facility specialty eye clinics for routine retinopathy screening, and then anywhere from six months, if you're lucky, to beyond 12 months, if ever, that patient eventually got into the health facility and was screened and then given follow-up as needed. At that point, also treated. But if they've been needing treatment for six months while sitting on that wait list or waiting to get into our clinics, then there was only so much we could do at that point. So a, a potential solution to this problem is teleretinal diabetic retinopathy screening. What this is, is we take a digital non-mandriotic camera, um, a retinal camera, and we can place it in primary care settings um, in diabetes clinics. Um, effective, and these are, have been shown to be effective for diabetic retinopathy screening. There's a very high sensitivity and specificity of this. It's been studied and shown many times. And actually, for sight-threatening retinopathy, it's 100% um, for both sensitivity and specificity. This has been implemented in other systems to a varying degree. Um, examples are the Veteran Affairs Network, Jocelyn Vision Network out of Boston, and the Indian Health Services. All of these are vertically integrated systems, so they have less of the challenge um, that we do in the referral side. Um, and so we can, they screen the patients, and then they have a different sense of sort of, uh, or a different pathway to plug those in than our challenges have been historically within the DHS system. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're meeting, meeting that challenge. So with these retinal image uploads and the secure web-based image viewing software, 
you can actually review these Im these images via store and forward telemedicine. So off-site, uh, a, a specialist or a trained reader can review the images, provide a screening result, and never have um, seen the patient in person. So in DHS, to operationalize this a little bit so you can see you know, how it works for us. Um, this is our model, uh, that we have identified the uh, diabetic patient at a primary care visit um, or a diabetes visit. The patient is sent for teleretinal screening at the end of this visit, the images um, or, or scheduled uh, to come back, in with it, but within the same clinic. And the images required via, are acquired via the camera. The photographer uploads these images to our software template. Uh, and then those images are transmitted to the reading center where they're then reviewed uh, by our readers, which in DHS we're using optometrists. And this report is generated back to the PCP and then um, or the referring provider the diabetes care provider and that person um, submits an e-consult which I think you'll hear a little bit more about in the breakout session today but that's our new uh, electronic referral system where we can actually triage these requests and see them in a more timely fashion based on the diagnosis and triage recommendations and we're very specific to these recommendations which again I'll, I'll speak to a little bit later on uh, to really direct where this patient goes how quickly and then uh, how quickly they'll get treated so um, some of our sites for diabetic retinopathy screening, um, our active sites are here uh, on, this, uh, on the left side. And uh, there's 11 of our active sites. And we have uh, several more upcoming. Uh, LA County USC is um, planning to roll out this month. And hopefully Harbor, uh, UCLA, and Roy Ball will soon follow. Our monthly volume to date is um, just a conglomerate to give you an idea of how quickly this can ramp up once you, we have so many diabetics, and once we actively get people involved, get a camera in place, start rolling things out, there's so many people to screen, it's quite uh, rapid that you can screen many patients. So what, you know, what, what does that look like? What are we referring in? You know, give you a breakdown of the case statistics of what we see. You know, this was um, up current through the end of October. We had screened um, a little bit over uh, 6,000 patients. And of those, um, and reviewed uh, a little bit under 6,000 of those cases. Um, and of those, 66%, um, almost 4,000 did not need to see an eye care provider. Um, they had minimal to no disease uh, and just needed repeat screening again in a year. And um, of those, uh, or of those needing to come in, 21% we referred for diabetic retinopathy. And that was all the way up for moderate disease where we just monitor and wanted to keep a little bit closer of an eye on patients up to the more severe levels um, and then even proliferative where we, where we do treatment. So the actual breakdown of treatable diabetic retinopathy when this, within this is 10%. Um, but this is you know, looking at all comers of everyone that we brought into the eye clinics for the 21%. And then we do, because we have optometry reading, we take advantage of that um, and we do pick up other eye conditions that people may need to be seen for, um, cataracts, glaucoma, um, or suspicion of glaucoma, I should say, um, and anything else that we're worried about, we bring that into the eye clinics as well. And that brought a, um, composed about 13% uh, percent extra of patients that we were bringing in. Again, the program is targeted towards diabetic retinopathy, but you know we're there, we're seeing patients in, uh, uh, via the telemedicine, we'll pick up what we can. So it, you know, to date, we've had a successful implementation of teleretinal diabetic retinopathy screening in the safety net. And this is the first time this has been implemented in the safety net due to the challenges of putting anything like this in with the referral structures, with the multi-tiered uh, facilities and, uh, and pathways that something like this needs to take. Uh, it, it has been a successful um, example of implementation. We've gotten retinal cameras in place. We've trained our photographers. Um, we have a very low ungradable rate due to the fact that we use a, a single drop dilation protocol. And that's also a big challenge in the safety net. Sick patients have sick eyes. And so often you'll get patients in that, um, you know, if you're not using uh, a, a dilation protocol or depending on the photographer training, you can get a lot of ungradable images with these programs. It also makes it difficult. Um, I mean, it's still a success to, to be screened screening you know, patients in a, in a newer, faster way than you were before. But if you're still getting 20% you know, of patients that need to come back in for repeat imaging, um, then you know, that can also decrease your effectiveness. So we have a very low ungradable percent, which is, um, I think, quite uh, excellent for this patient population and for really using our patient's time effectively, as well as our provider and photographer time. Um, we have a reading center in place with our optometrist reading. And then we're triaging these patients to get them into treatment faster with the use of e-consult. So already, we're screening patients, you know, more patients in a shorter time than we were before. So I think we're um, quite uh, along that pathway of meeting the triple aim that Dr. Guterman talked about. Um, and our goal is really in this to improve 
improve access to and quality of care to treat those patients that need it in a timely manner. And so to get at that point that we're really just trying to treat the patient uh, in a way that they need it, I want to talk about um, some, I want to go back to this slide here and point out something that may not, is very critical to this, but may not have been as evident whenever I first talked about it. And that's here, the referring provider, most often the PCP, but really the diabetes care provider. You're integral to every step of this process, um, to identifying the diabetic patient, to referring them in, um, to making sure they get the, t the they get screening, to receiving the report, and to really understanding what's going on with the, in the back of this patient's eyes. It's a the disease is part of the patient as a whole, and then to helping that patient get into the eye clinic uh, for submitting uh, the referral uh, and really being a point person for the care of the systemic disease of this patient. The results that may be seen back, um, that uh, you may get back, I wanted to detail here, that um, patients screened for, um, we screen for mild, or some of the results you may see, and these are the results of the screening, mild non-proliferative disease, um, moderate, severe, and then proliferative, which are the levels that we start to treat, significant macular edema, and then of course the other conditions that I mentioned. From these results and from that diagnosis, then we generate these referral guidelines, which are very, very specific. So this is what can be seen back in the report. Um, all the way from, you know, no or mild disease to just repeating the photo in a year, um, all the way to, uh, the, you know, the treatment clinics where we're getting patients into the ophthalmology and tertiary level centers much faster. So we detail not only location, timing, uh, and ophthalmology versus optometry. Um, so we try to be very specific. But what I've also tried to highlight here is um, that, you know, the systemic nature of the treatment that's needed. And so, you know, we get it a little bit that in our referral guidelines of, of, of uh, sort of a gentle reminder to the patient as well that this is truly a systemic disease. In the end, we can treat diabetic retinopathy, but we cannot cure it. It's the systemic disease that has to be treated before any of this will go away. Otherwise, we will just treat and treat and treat and treat. But the person that can really make a difference uh, in this battle is if we work together, if this is, a, this is really a partnership between the specialist and the diabetes care provider to make a difference and to make this disease go away. So that brings us to the teachable moment that this uh, program provides. Uh, health behavior theories in general suggest that medical imagery can outperform words and numbers in terms of fostering learning, motivation, behavior change, uh, and influences motivation and subsequent behavior by increasing a patient's perception of their own risk. People see that they're not completely invulnerable. Uh, and so that's health behavior in general. And I'd like, you know, there's, there's been studies in diabetic ret retinopathy which have actually looked at this um, in terms of the retinal images. It was a small pilot study out of Australia, which I wanted to highlight, with 25 patients with non-proliferative disease and a hemoglobin A1C greater than 7 that actually showed significantly greater improvement in the hemoglobin A1C um, in three months, so a change in the, in the um, systemic disease when uh, the retinal images were shown and an enhanced motivation to improve the blood glucose management. So uh, the images actually, you know, this highlights that participants uh, viewed their own retinal images, which actually anyone can do via the software program that we use. We provide anyone um, who may desire as part of the diabetes care team a login to the um, image software program that has the read but also has the images. So anyone uh, that desires and, and, and would like to review with the patient the images, we have that potential. But really what I want to focus on here is that they discussed all of these things. So the retinal images were really a vehicle for a conversation with the patient about these really important things that cover all aspects of diabetes care, all the way from the retina and the eye care, the retina, how it works, how suboptimal glucose control can damage the retina, uh, and then you know some of the things we've talked about here, the asymptomatic, of di asymptomatic nature of diabetic retinopathy, importance of screening, but then it became much more broad and also much more focused on diabetes, things that I find a lot of the patients that I'm seeing on the eye care side, although they've been diagnosed and treated with diabetes, don't really understand is what is a hemoglobin A1C? What are their target levels? How they can improve their blood glucose control with diet, exercise, uh, and medication. And then uh, also, you know, what support options are available for helping patients improve their diabetes care when they really want to. So uh, I think it's really important that, uh, you know, this study show that, that um, they were able to use these, you know, use these retinal images to emphasize the important connection between self-care behavior and long-term eye health, which really extrapolates into the overall health. So for my final slide, I hope I've gotten your attention because the entire message here is that you have theirs, so use it. Fear of blindness is a very powerful thing, but we can use that fear for something positive. Screening for diabetic retinopathy and the results of that screening 
or a powerful weapon that we can all use to increase patient education and patient motivation to combat this life and sight-threatening disease. So finally, um, thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great talk, Lauren. Well, let's just do one question here. We can talk a little bit more at the break for other questions. Sure. Maria? Sorry. Oh, you have no. No. Well, you go, you go well, what are your feelings about the studies that show that if a patient's retinal exam is negative, that you don't really have to do it in a year, that you can do it in two years, and in one study showing in three years? I think those studies are... Therefore, wouldn't that help the soul? Yes, situation? absolutely. The problem with a lot of these studies is they haven't been done on our patient population. So if you look, it, but I mean, do I agree that that's possible? Absolutely. I think the difficulty of citing that as you know evidence based in our patient population is that a lot of the the um, their high hemoglobin A1C category, if you look at it, was patients with hemoglobin A1C after, over nine. So what about the patients of hemoglobin A1C with fourteen? You know, we see those patients. You know, we have ones with eleven and above. They didn't have. They nobody has really looked at those that are really high, so we can't say for sure that those people aren't going to progress in two years, but has that move been made by a lot of, you know, a lot of, not necessarily safety net systems, but the VA, et cetera, yes, and I mean, I think it's a very good one. I think it's just hard to say that we have evidence out there that fully supports it in our population, but I certainly think that that's something we could absolutely do uh, and and uh, that would be helpful on both our resource limitation sides. My question is about once you identify the patient access. How timely is the access for the patient or is the patient treated at the facility? For the, on the eye care side. Well, yeah, that's one of the great things is that now that we have e-consult, so we can actually, we give the recommendations, which I show with that table, so we're very specific about how soon and where a patient can get in, and with e-consult, we can actually honor those recommendations. So we get the patients in according to those recommendations when they pass for e-consult. That's, that's, the, that's the scheduling um, recommendation there, so they should be booked within four weeks. And when we see the patients, we will treat same day if needed. I mean, it, you know, sometimes we, you know, ultimately may we try to b book these patients into a laser clinic or something like that, sure, when we can kind of tailor out our scheduling mechanisms, but on the specialist side, if we see a patient that needs treatment and it's, you know, 6, 7 p.m., we just treat them that day. All of our general ophthalmologists treat diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. 